to say that Art Vision was uh, uh, constituted uh, um, 25 years ago um, by a group of artists which were belonging to different disciplines, uh, theater, cinema, literature, painting, uh, just to have a common ground to share uh, uh, the creative ideas and to share the experiences. So continuing on these premises, uh, the 25th anniversary uh, is celebrating uh, with this kind of uh, event, which is uh, dance across genres. And uh, um, we, it is done in collaboration of Art Vision and the Visual Art Gallery of the India Habitat Center. So this year, uh, the, today is the first of the series and uh, it is reviewing dance. How much the review of a single performance can inform about and give justice to the entire journey which is behind it. A performance lives only until it lasts. And what remains is the page of history which the reviewer writes. Certainly not a small job and not to be taken so lightly. Dancers, choreographers and critics stand on two opposite sides. The ones offering, exposing themselves without any reserve, and the others judging and dissecting. Can be a dialogue between the two, and how much this dialogue could contribute to a better understanding of the art of the single republic. We have here today one of the most renowned dance critics and dance historian of the present time. One who not only is a profound connoisseur of the Western classical dance scenario, but also one of the few who dare to bridge the gap between the Western and the Indian dance styles by personally visiting dance schools in India and attending and reviewing a number of Indian dance performances, both in India and America. Alistair McClure, McClure, McClure. <laughs> <laughs> I already forgot it. Was <laughs> was the chief dance critic of the New York Times from 2007 until he retired in 2018. He was previously chief dance critic at the Times and Literary Supplement and the chief theater critic of the Financial Times, both of London. He founded the British Quarterly Dance Theater Journal in 1983. In addition to his roles as critic, Mokla has written for the New Yorker and also published a biography on Margot Fontaine and a book on conversations with Mathieu Bon. So now I leave uh, all to Alistair. I am not pronouncing your surname anymore because I'm not sure. So <laughs> please go ahead. One more thing, at the end of his presentation, we will open up for question and answers, which you can have either through the chatting or if you want to come in person, then please raise your hands and your mic will be unmuted. To you, Alistair. 
Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, we've had every kind of problem in preparation today. The sound kept on not working. So I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see me. I hope it works. And if you want to check the pronunciation of my name, it's Alistair Macaulay. But when I visited India, it was a lot of fun to hear the different ways that people pronounce my name. And of course, beneath, I'm living in London, which I'm in, from England, but many people in America pronounce it Macaulay. And so there's lots of different. If I go to France, it's Macaulay and so forth. Don't don't worry. Um, my subject really today is for whom does the critic write? Uh, and I'm dedicating it to Sunil Katari, the memory of Sunil Katari, the important Indian critic who just died at the end of last year, 2020, um, of coronary complications, but he had suffered from COVID towards the end of the year. He was a friend of mine. I knew him for about the last 10 years of his life. Um, and I met him in both several cities in India and in several cities of America. We were colleagues. Um, and really, I'm speaking this address partly in my mind to him because it's a conversation I would have liked to have had with him when he was alive. Um, I never met him in England. Now, I'm now back in England where I come from. Uh, I'm speaking in my home in London. I'm a critic, I'm a historian, but as you've just heard for 25 years, I was the chief critic of one newspaper or another. Just over 13 years, I was the chief theatre critic of the Financial Times in London. And then I went to New York and I was the chief dance critic uh, of the New York Times for almost 12 years. Um, after that, I felt newspapered out. Looking back, I often think of the people for whom I wrote and the people who wrote to me about my reviews. Um, for some people, of course, I was the wrong critic. I was controversial. I had the wrong opinions. Um, to me, that's natural. You're not going to please everybody. Um, but particularly when you rather critical the New York Times, a lot of people flatter you and praise you and tell you you're so right, blah, blah, all the rubbish about I, the perfection of your reviews. And the first thing I often say is I agree with everything you say. And I want to say straight away that though that's very kindly meant uh, and very flattering often when you first hear it and it suggests the meeting of minds, actually it's useless. Um, there's no way I can write reviews that everybody will agree with. There's no way that I can set out trying to write a review that will chime a chord with everybody in my readership. Um, if you try to write reviews that everybody will agree with, you're going to be very boring. You're going to be very bland, very safe. You have to take risks and you often have to do the opposite. You have to find what seems absolutely most intimate in your own feelings, your own heart, and explore that and try to bring that to the fore in your own review. Very often when you are writing, and I'm sitting here by myself in my room, my study in London, this is where I've written so many of my reviews, not the ones in New York, but the ones I wrote for the Financial Times for many years. Um, you see a performance with thousands of people or hundreds of people around you in the theater, and then you come home and you sit by yourself, you think and you write, I've got my laptop in front of me. That's where I would write it as a rule. Um, it's a strange, and very moving process this, alternating between being in company with the audience all around you and then being alone, you just writing the words, which will in a few hours maybe reach thousands, sometimes millions of readers. Um, you have to find what is intimate to you to go for your feeling and to share that with all of those people. It's a very strange process. The beauty of it, it does open you up. And if the performer is vulnerable, so are you. Um, so don't try to write for the people who will agree with you. Feel free of that. A second category that many people feel that criticism is for, and this is the conversation I so much wish I had had with the wonderful critic Sunil Katari, whom I mentioned, um, is the practitioner, the dancer, the actor, the musician, um, because nobody is going to be more intimately involved in what you write in your review. Um, but it's actually very complex. 
In the 1940s, the great New York critic Edwin Denby, who worked in New York, mainly for the New York Herald Tribune in the 1940s, wrote a wonderful essay on dance criticism in which he famously said, in my opinion, reading reviews of oneself, and he was speaking as if he was a dancer, is a waste of time, like smoking cigarettes, he said. And he said reading reviews of somebody else uh, would be much more useful. That's interesting. Um, we can talk about that. But on the whole, I agree with him that it's not a good idea to read reviews of yourself. Nonetheless, here am I with 40 years experience as a critic, 25 for important newspapers. Um, and I very well know that important dancers and choreographers and playwrights and actors certainly sometimes read what I write. Um, and the results can be interesting. I'm just going to give you four examples. The New York ballerina Maria Karaski recently announced that she would be retiring this October. She's a leading ballerina with New York City Ballet. She's been dancing leading roles for well over 20 years. So I wrote to her just to say that I was sorry I was in London because I had reviewed her performances in New York for so many years uh, and that I was excited to have watched so much of her career, but she and I both knew I had not always praised her. And she, a very generous soul, wrote straight back saying, you have been a massive part of my career. I feel I've grown a great deal over the years in the wake of your criticisms. Now that's a remarkable thing because truly not all of my reviews of Maria Karaski were complimentary. Um, some of them truly were, but I did watch her change. I was very excited to see her change and to report on that, um, perhaps she felt supported by the fact that I could see the change in her work. I don't want to speculate too much on what she felt. I wrote back saying, I'm sorry you read my reviews in some ways, I didn't write for you. And she said, don't worry, I was used to have friends who told me which reviews to read. And there were other reviews she didn't read. Um, another one is the choreographer Richard Alston, who is British and I have watched his work for over 40 years. Um, it's less often when I was in New York, but in one case, he brought a work set to Mozart music um, called Unfinished Business. And I didn't like to talk to Richard Alston, even though I had known him somewhat for decades, but I didn't like to talk to him before I saw the performance or immediately afterwards. And having seen it, in this case, I loved it. I went back, wrote my review, it came out in the New York Times, and then because I thought it was a wonderful piece, I went the next day to see it again. And now that my review was published, he came up and said, I have to tell you that I am very pleased with this piece, I'm so pleased that you liked it, but I really brought it to New York so that you could see it. I don't think that any of the British critics really quite got what I was doing. And I just thought, let's try bringing it to America. Maybe Alistair McCauley will be the right critic for it. That's a very extraordinary situation. And I don't recommend that people generally bring pieces abroad for a critic to review. But it was very both exciting and humbling for me uh, and a great privilege. It was a beautiful piece and I was thrilled to write about it. Another example is the great playwright still living with us and still writing, um, Tom Stoppard. And I reviewed at least six of his world premieres when I was a London theatre critic. Um, his world famous long before I entered the theatre scene. I particularly reviewed plays of his between 1997 and 2007. And I mention him simply because when I left the Financial Times to move to New York in 2007, he just wrote a card to me simply to say, you will be very much missed. And I was very obviously flattered by that, but how interesting that a very successful playwright who is a millionaire, who has worked in films as well as plays, whose plays run in the West End at the National Theatre, should be grateful for criticism because again, not all of my words were kind about his. Generally, I think he is a great playwright, no question, but I found fault in some plays. Um, interestingly, he seems to have welcomed part of that. Um, extraordinary situation for me. And the fourth of these examples I want to mention is another great playwright, um, now dead, Harold Pinter. And let's see if I can find this. You probably won't be able to see it clearly, but 
imagine you can read this properly. In 1996, I reviewed the world premiere of his Ashes to Ashes, and he wrote me this postcard, which simply said, Dear Alistair, I was very moved by your response to Ashes to Ashes. And as you can see, I framed it. I have it on my wall because to receive this from the man who many people have think thought was the greatest playwright of the day, this was a huge privilege. Um, and for the next, I met him after that, uh, and we would meet sometimes over the next 10 years. I didn't like all of his plays, his revivals, um, but Ashes to Ashes was interesting because it was not one of his big successes. Um, it has been seen in many countries, but has not generally been accepted as a Penta classic. But somehow it spoke completely to me, and I thought, though it wasn't a perfect play, it was his greatest play. It went further into politics and psychology and mystery than any other work he had written. Um, and I had the feeling, Pinter said very little, but I had the feeling that he felt I was writing along the right lines and he was encouraging me. So I went on exploring his plays in what I wrote. And about 10 years later, in 2006, I wrote a an essay called Pinter's Women, about the women in Pinter's plays and his poetry. Pinter got terribly excited by it and made all of his friends read it. And I was very complimented by this, but I eventually had to say, look, Harold, you've had a lot of reviews over the years. Um, can I ask why you're excited over this review? This isn't the first positive review you've ever had. And being very Harold Pinter, he didn't give me a direct reply. But he simply said, yes, it's true. I've had a lot of positive reviews. And he mentioned one magazine that only gave him positive reviews. And he said, with reviews like that, as a rule, I can just take them or leave them. But you, he just said, you, you're really in it. And I've been thinking about that strange reply ever since as to what he meant. It's not the kind of thing I can put on my tombstone. I can't put it on the back of the book. You're really in it, Harold Pinter. Um, it would be fun. Um, what did he mean? I think, and I hope, he meant that I'd got into his thought process and in the thought process within the plays, which is what matters most. If so, then I was doing my duty, my, my privilege as a critic. And what I want to say about these four people is however grateful I am for the compliments they paid me, I am far more grateful to them as I am to all important playwrights, choreographers, dancers. They open up areas in my mind, make the whole world of the arts larger for me and give me new things to write about. Um, it is a voyage of discovery, criticism. It's not a history of what one already knows. You are forever going into the unknown as a critic in just about every review you write. It's an adventure. Um, so to return to my question, for whom does the critic write? I often think of a critic I didn't much like, a London critic, he's called Edwin Thorpe, and he wrote for the London Evening Standard for many years. And in about 1978, 43 years ago, I heard him give a talk and he said, I'll tell you who I write for. Um, he was talking about the London Underground. I, did, I hope you can imagine the subway system, metropolitan underground system of London. You've probably seen it in the movies, even if you don't know London. Uh, and he said, I'm imagining somebody sitting on the Northern Line. And the Northern Line is not the most beautiful line of the London Underground. And he said, and they've, the, the train stops and they've got nothing to read as it's stuck between stations because something has gone on. They've got nothing to read except the Evening Standard. And they read the front page and they read the back page and they read the middle pages. And finally, they read the arts page because there is nothing else to read. And finally, they read the dance review because there is nothing else to read. He said, that's the person for whom I write my reviews. And I love that. And I'm like that too in my work. You try to read for the general reader who may have no interest in your field whatsoever because you are trying to show them that dance, theater, the arts, going to performances is something for any civilized person that is larger than the world just of the people who do it 
and the people who are obsessive attenders of theatres. Um, people often read reviews because they want experts, they want expertise. Well, critics do go to a lot of performances. I'm embarrassed to tell you how many Swan Lake performances or Sleeping Beauty performances I've seen. In 1990, I counted, I'd seen each of those two ballets 200 times. I must have seen well over 300 Swan Lakes, 300 Sleeping Beauties now. And yet, my point is, of course, that I'm still not the most knowledgeable person in the world about those ballets or about the Shakespeare plays I've seen many times. I've reviewed Hamlet over 30 times. There's always mystery there. There's something more for me to discover. These works are larger than us. Um, really, a critic has to come to everything as if it's new for the first time, because very often it is a world premiere, or it is the debut of a new actor doing Hamlet for the first time, or a dancer doing Giselle for the first time, or a dancer who's just appearing in New York in their first Bharatanatyam performance. All of these things are new. You've got to be there as if re as capturing the sense of novelty, excitement, introduction to your readers. You're really introducing them also to yourself and by writing you're discovering what you feel about them. You don't know when you see a performance exactly what you feel. I think every critic will tell you the same thing, that by writing you come to terms better with your own feelings. You come to understand what you saw. I'll come back to that. Um, readers do come to critics, of course, because they want information. Um, when I first came to London in 1976, um, I started to go to ballet a lot, and I knew nothing about ballet. Um, so I would read three particular critics in daily newspapers. I would read James Monaghan Kennedy in The Guardian, and I always agreed with him. And that was wonderful because it made me feel I wasn't so dumb. And I read John Percival and the Times, and John Percival was intelligent and gave me a lot of information. So in a way, he was more useful to me, even though I didn't always feel my mind was like his. But I also read Clement Crisp in the Financial Times. Financial Times in those days had, I believe, the greatest arts page in London. And Clement Crisp, whom I often disagreed with, but he had such a wide scope of reference and he wrote with such eloquence that he opened up the world of dance for me. And I thought, there, yeah, I'm not just a crazy man enjoying going to dance. I'm an intelligent person listening, reading to this critic of experience and intelligence. This is something for grown ups, for adults, for intelligent people to pursue. And not just intelligent people, people with feeling and passion. That's what I felt I was. How good to find a critic who had that too. And sometimes disagreeing with such a critic was a treat. Um, When I'm reviewing Indian dance, yes, I've been to India twice, uh, both times for four weeks, and I've traveled around from several states, um, between several states. I've seen Indian dance in London, Edinburgh, New York, Washington, elsewhere. But the truth is when I review this Manipuri couple, when I review this Chao soloist, when I review this Odissi company, I'm still an outsider. There is still so much about these forms. I cannot pretend to know with any great authority. If I achieve anything by writing about these Indian dancers, I do so by saying how they look to me, writing in New York, as I so often did, or now as they look to me in London. And I hope and I think that Indian dancers often feel grateful because they know how they look to their colleagues, but they never know until they come to New York and read about, read reviews, how they seem to a different culture. That's when not just Indian dance, but all forms of culture start to take off. We start to see ourselves in different lights. Um, it's a big challenge for a critic. It's a big privilege. You make yourself larger by doing it. Um, if you read philosophers about criticism, or if you read theory, theorists about aesthetics, they'll tell you that the process of criticism um, 
have various stages. So let me list them for you. Um, I don't really think one thinks about this when one's writing a review, but when one sits back, one can analyze it a bit. First of all, you describe. You simply give a picture of what the play, the dance, the music was like. Second, you analyze. You say what kind of music this was, what kind of dancing this was, what was going on, how this connects to other styles. Um, then you third state contextualize by putting it into context. You either put it into context of your city, London, New York, India, um, Bhubaneswar, Delhi, um, but also into the larger cult context of Indian culture or London theater. There are so many different contexts. When we're talking about Indian dance, you talk about how the Indian body in dancing varies, say, from the ballet body in Western culture or the tango body in social dancing. All of these things present the body in a different way, and one can compare all of those to the body in sculpture, Indian sculpture, Greek sculpture, modern Western sculpture. There are so many styles. All of these things are arranged from which the critic can call. Um, the fourth stage is interpretation. You talk about meaning. And here, things become very complicated because there are two main differences. There's the meaning that the playwright or the dancer intended, the one that they meant to show, but there's also the meaning that you derive yourself, which may not be at all what they meant. Um, and really that to you is the more important. Sometimes when you go to the theater, you will see a program that's saying this dance or this play is about such and such. But as you watch, you think, well, I know the choreographer, the playwright says this, but actually I feel they're expressing something quite different. Um, you need courage in those circumstances, but talk about what it is you felt, what you got from that performance. The next stage on the list is usually evaluation. Um, you add up, you judge the work. Um, as my friend said in her introduction, yes, the critic judges the word. Critic comes from the Greek, word kritikos, kritis, meaning judge, judge-like. Um, today, there's quite an argument about whether the critic should judge a great deal, um, whether he should not just report on a work, and whether value judgments are not wrong, particularly when a work is new and when the artist is vulnerable. I can only say that for me, evaluation is a necessary part. It shows how every other aspect of the mental process of watching a work of art comes into play. And I realize I, when I'm describing a dance, I'm describing it as I'm reaching a value about it. And also my sense of value goes the other way that I know I liked watching it, loved watching it. So now I've got to find the description that will bring my feeling to life for my readers. I've got to justify what I said, what I felt, to connect head and heart. That's what criticism is so much about. So those are the official five stages of criticism. Um, there is a sixth which people don't talk about. And that's simply, and this word would probably be misunderstood, it's simply entertainment. The critic is there for his readers, her readers. They're there to put on a good show. They're actually like performers. Um, you are there to make your reader want to keep on reading your review from the beginning to the end. There's so many reviews that aren't well written, and we simply look for the beginning and the end, and we look at where the opinion is. We don't need to read the whole review. No, an important review is one that will sustain the reader right throughout it. Um, it's quite a challenge. When I wrote for the New York Times, um, I've always loved writing essays at greater length than magazines, but at the Financial Times, I had written 550 words in each of my reviews. And then in my last two years, they had cut that to 350 words. All newspapers were giving less space. I somehow thought when I went to New York that I was going to be writing this kind of length. And then in my first week, in New York, my editor came to me and said, we haven't agreed how much you're going to write for that first review of yours at New York City Ballet. And 
I gulped and I was sitting down there. He was a big man standing up there. So I looked down at my desk rather than looking up at him. And I thought, well, I really would like more than three or 500 words, but I don't know how to ask of it. I'm, I'm, I'm very weak in these situations. So I just paused and I kept quiet. And this big man looked down at me and just said, a thousand words. So I said, a thousand words, <laughs> and tried to keep calm. And then I realized that the New York Times gives a thousand words to its chief critics. And uh, the, the whole scope of my work from then on was going to be different because now I was going to be asked to write a long review for just about everything I would write for the next, well, I was there for almost 12 years. And to write at that kind of length and space changed the whole scope of what I could do because I had so much more um, to describe, to justify, to argue, to explain in my work. And I think it opened me, developed me as a critic considerably. Um, I hope so. Um, I'm almost at the end of what I have to say to you. I hope you've got questions ready for me. Um, I'm of course just scraping the surface, but to explain this process, of what it is like trying to write a review, I go back to another critic, Andrew Porter, who was really one of the founding figures of the arts page at the Financial Times and became both its first chief music critic and its first chief dance critic. And famously, when he'd been with the newspaper for 10 or 15 years, he came in all agitated to write his review on the night one night. And colleagues said to him, what were you reviewing? And he said, oh, this work by Benjamin Britten, I don't know what I think about it. Uh, and they, he then went to the Financial Times typewriter these days before computers and wrote for an hour and a half. And then when he came out, he handed his review to the editor and just said, there, I know now that that piece of music was the greatest thing Benjamin Britten ever wrote. Um, I love that story because it shows you how a critic can start to realize how great a work of art is only as he is doing the writing or she is doing the writing. Um, as you write, you understand your opinions better, your mind better, your feelings better. It's a great adventure and you do it by writing for as many readers as possible, opening the field up. I hope that makes sense. Thank you very much for listening. Bye. I can see a face, but I can't hear anything. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh, yes, it was many, many, many points. Uh, very interesting. You know, uh, we'll be waiting uh, to see if uh, the question are coming from uh, our uh, Yes, uh, Mona Lee. Uh, is uh, first, uh, yes. Let oh. me uh, just, uh, so, yes. Uh, just, um, I have one or two questions myself and then I will <laughs> show you come to you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I was um, interested in many of the things which you said. Uh, one uh, interesting was uh, for me when you said that uh, for a certain dancer, you had uh, uh, followed her along the year and uh, you had uh, sort of documented uh, all the changes. And uh, so I think that is a very important thing because uh, um, just to evaluate uh, one single performance, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, I, I think, uh, does give justice to the journey of the, of the dancer. And, uh, and uh, it's, it, according to me, it's important if, you can follow her uh, growth or, or his growth and uh, put it in that context also when you said about the context, the context of the life journey of the, uh, of, of the choreographer of the dancer. Well, that so sounds that, nice as I'm saying it, but of course, when she first read my reviews and I was noticing more of the negative qualities, she must have felt very vulnerable if she read all of my reviews. Um, it was only because I watched her over 12 years, I really saw how she blossomed as an artist. And she was brave enough to go on reading my reviews. It's a very dangerous thing for a dancer or any artist to do because some critics are just the wrong critics for you. Um, in this case, it worked. Right, what, what, what do you think about this aging dancer, aging, aging dancer, which is coming out and how much, what is it? 
age of a dancer, which uh, uh, one should keep, uh, one should, when a dancer should stop dancing, or okay. is there any age, or is there any uh, things like this when somebody should stop? Well, you can't say that there is an age, uh, one single age for any dance form. Um, there are certain dancers who carry on past their peak. Nothing will stop them. Uh, I was lucky that when I came to dancing, I saw Rudolf Nureyev, perhaps the most famous dancer in the world, at his peak still in the late mid 70s. But then just around the time I became a critic, in fact, just before I became a critic, he passed his prime and it often became, I felt, embarrassing to watch him. And most of the time I wrote him about him, I just had to complain. Um, nothing stopped Nureyev. He was the most famous person in the world, in the dance world, and he often performed eight times a week, especially in London, where I was. Um, I just had to say what I saw, I'm afraid. Um, obviously, many more dancers, many dancers are much more vulnerable than Nureyev. Um, it doesn't come up very often, dancers carrying on longer than they should. Most dancers start to feel their bodies telling them to retire and some quite often dancers leave before we want them to, to do so. Um, so it's a subtle thing. You just simply have to adjust your opinion with each dancer. There are some dancers who will go on giving golden performances into their fifties and others who pass their prime in their thirties. It's up to that. It's not even just a quality of body, it's a quality of mind too. There are some dancers as their physiques can do less and less, their mind somehow can do more and more and you go on learning from them even though they can't jump so high or move so fast. Thank you. So we go now uh, one uh, question. Uh, my question is uh, uh, the question is from Kostevi um, is about the cultural connotations of your ship question is around the politics of art reception. Indian dance really has a different relationship with audience reception as compared to the distant viewer of the West. How do you grapple with that? Do you think of that at all? So the different relationship with audience reception in the East and the West. Um, I do think about it. I'm not sure how much one can ever get this right. I think the general difference I see between reviewing Indian dance and Western dance is that so often Indian dancers see themselves as the part of something much larger, that they are addressing something cosmic or divine, which happens not very regularly in Western dance. And that particularly can have the effect of making Indian dancers there's a bad noise on this line. I hope you can hear me still. Um, it has the effect of making Indian dancers, I find, very beautifully modest because they're not coming on to saying, I'm the show, I'm the one who matters. They are connecting the audience to Vishnu, Shiva, whatever deity they're considering, or something just larger than themselves, nature itself. Um, I find that very beautiful in Indian dancing. I love Western dancing too, and of course it connects with my nervous system, the way I uh, am. Um, but I, I hope I've become a, a larger person by trying to describe that different kind of persona that Indian dancers uh, achieve at their best. I hope that makes sense. I always feel a little nervous in talking about one culture to another, but one should, because that's what we do in civilization. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, as a ballet, uh, there is another uh, question. As a ballet dancer, I just wanted to mention that I love the fact that you were able to see the Swan Lake numerous times, because it is beautiful. It's a beautiful and elegant piece. If you ask me, how did the piece make you feel every time you watch it live? <laughs> well, there's great many different Swan Lakes. 
I used to see the Royal Ballet production at Covent Garden um, before I became a critic. And I saw it with perhaps 12 very different ballerinas. I saw it with Lynn Seymour and Natalia Makarova and Monica Mason and others. These are the great ballerinas of the mid seventies. Uh, and I thought I knew a thing or two. What I didn't know is that some productions are very different. And I became a critic in May, 1978. And I was invited by London Festival Ballet to review their production of Swan Lake with five casts. And I thought a professional critic should go to all five casts. So I aged, I think I was now just 23, went to see all five casts. Actually, it was a terrible production and the dancers were not good. Um, and I had to, I was really in shock because I, had to, I thought I knew Swan Lake and I didn't know what Swan Lake could be. I just thought Swan Lake was always going to be as it was at Covent Garden. The answer is, of course, no. It depends on uh, certain kinds of style, certain kinds of production. Over the years, of course, I've started to realize that my Royal Ballet experience was also inadequate as to what could be great about Swan Lake. Then I started to see the great Russian companies in the 1980s, and particularly when I saw the Kirov production uh, in the early 1980s, that made me think, oh, it's as if I've never seen Swan Lake before. It opened again, Swan Lake up to me. So Swan Lake has just become an object of study to me. Uh, some performances still move me very much. Um, but I'm also trying to go back to those early Swan Lakes I saw in my memory and trying to work out what it was about some of them that moved me so deeply and whether that was what is in Swan Lake itself. So I do more as I get older, real history research into the 19th century original Swan Lake and to other people who, are, and I work with people who are researching that Swan Lake too. Um, this is the life as a critic, I'm afraid. It, it never ends. You just have to go on studying, researching. And sometimes that's exhausting and sometimes it's very rewarding. Okay. And, uh, uh, Arsha is asking, um, what is the advice you would like uh, to give to new critics about the ethics of writing as a critic? Ethics. Ethics. Um, well, there are so many ethics uh, and they differ from culture to culture, from newspaper to newspaper. For example, I've talked about my communications with two playwrights, one choreographer and one dancer. But generally, it's a very good question as to whether it's ethical for a critic to be in touch with the people he writes about. And usually I'm not. Usually I see the performance and I go and write about it. And very often I don't ever meet any of the dancers I write about or the actors or the playwrights. I've just given you ex exceptions, really. I think I'd been writing about Maria Karaski for nine or 10 years before I ever met her. Um, I had grown up knowing who Harold Pinter was and writing about his plays before I ever met him. That happens gradually and very often it never happens and that's a good thing. So that's one form of ethics. I think you can probably think of others too. Um, in some ways dance itself addresses ethics because it addresses humanity, it addresses energy and by watching almost any form of dancing, you're seeing some kind of philosophical expression. Philosophy and ethics aren't the same things, but they are related. Um, you're seeing an image of behavior um, in dancing. You connect it to your image of the images of behavior you admire or don't admire in life. So investigating the ethics you see on stage is also part of the, the journey. I'm not sure I'm answering your question adequately, and I'm sure there are other aspects of ethics you've got in your mind. So if you want to be more specific, please do. I hope I've begun to develop the field a little. Uh, yeah, I don't know if Arsha wants to uh, ask more, but at this point, uh, I just wanted to add that uh, there is a situation here in India, which I always was wondering. There is this festival, and the organizer is uh, um, spon not sponsoring, yeah, the travel and the hospitality to the dance critic. And I wonder in that situation, when you are, you are guest of the, of the organizer, how much you can maintain yourself objective, objective in, 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 in reviewing. I mean, that should be 
I always, I always thought that the newspaper should send the, 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 the critic. It should not be the, the dancer who is sponsoring the critic for her own festival. But this is what happened here. Uh, so how much you can, uh, you can talk badly about uh, this uh, person who is uh, hosting you and uh, feeding you and uh, uh, sponsoring you? <laughs> So <laughs> um, it will vary from culture to culture so much. And this is really why I would have liked to have had this conversation with Sunil Kotari, um, wonderful Indian dancer, but he dance critic, but he knew everybody he was writing about. Uh, and sometimes he would go from his seat in the theater at the end of the to go and visit the dancer in the dressing room. For me and for anybody in the, well, in America or London, that's more or less unthinkable, though I can think of one or two who have done it. But generally, you should not do it, and I would not do it myself. Um, I also feel that simply dancers are very vulnerable people, and even if you've loved their performance, I would try never to see them immediately after once the rest of that day, because what you, particularly the critic, uh, may feel about them um, can have a, a disproportionate importance to them. I'll give you, I'm not sure if this answers your question or the issue, but perhaps the most famous dancer in the world for the last 30 years is Mikhail Baryshnikov. Um, he's been on films, he's been on television, he's now I think over 70, but he is a legendary dancer. Um, about 30 years ago, he appeared at Sadler's Wells. I wasn't reviewing, but I was lucky that I had two tickets. He danced sensationally well. Um, I did know a dancer in his company. And I mentioned to somebody who worked at Sadler's Wells what a great performance that was by Brizhnikov, and I liked the company very much. And I know this dancer, and I would love just to say hello. Um, and so he said, oh, this person who works at well, come back and I'll see if we can find his dressing room. Well, I shouldn't have gone backstage anyway, but as it happened, we, I and my friend could not get to the dressing room of the dance. We stood knocking on the door and nobody opened the door. But what I didn't know is his dressing room was directly opposite Baryshnikov's dressing room. So there was I feeling, I'm a critic, I should never, never be backstage. Baryshnikov then opened the door of his dressing room. It, there were about 15 or 20 people outside, all blowing kisses at Baryshnikov and telling him he was marvellous. Baryshnikov is the most sensitive person about reviews in the world, even though he's very, very famous. And I think I knew this. So I was trying to hide. I didn't want him to see me. I was so embarrassed and I wasn't there to see him. But he also has eyes like an exorcist missile. He saw me at once across all these people. And because he's a clever chap, he knew how to talk to these people here and then look across them and just try to catch my eye. So finally, I couldn't hide. Um, <laughs> he was waiting to catch my eye. So eventually I just mimed and just said something like, oh, I think I put my hand on my heart and partly through my eyes and then applauded, you know, and thumbs up. All the thing you could do say, I was so moved. It was wonderful and so forth. And Brzezhnikov found out a way to say, oh, miming back, really? Do you think this is true? And it did teach me. I was, I was breaking ethics but, uh, and doing something I should never do. And it showed me how very vulnerable the most, the greatest of dancers can be at that particular moment. I, I will try never to do that again to be backstage in those circumstances. I was lucky that I was able to tell him he was wonderful and I meant it sincerely, but I should not be the person to say that at that time. Well, <laughs> uh, I would really like Sumi to be here <laughs> and, and reply um, And I, I should go on with that. There, from country to country, there's a different practice as to whether critics receive any invitations to review that are paid in various ways. Um, and this is changing even in London right now. Um, originally, the practice was absolutely that companies invited you to review. You, you might be given a glass of wine in the interval, but not anything more than that, and usually not that. Um, and you were then left to write your review, and they did not comment when you wrote your review. They just simply gave you the seats. Um, I would still say that is generally the practice in America to a large degree. 
But I think in Europe, and perhaps to some degree now in Britain, critics are sometimes flown from place to place so that if you're a London critic and so-and-so in Dublin or Moscow or Paris wants you to see their show, they will pay for you to see them. And officially the understanding is you are still free to write negative reviews of them if that's what you mean. But it's a complicated situation and I know critics who like receiving their trips to Paris and Moscow and Rome and glamorous cities and tend not to write very negative reviews in those circumstances. They will, they will not be invited the next time. <laughs> Um, I found myself at the Financial Times at one point, we were encouraged to take trips like that. I just found after the first few of them, I couldn't do it. So for myself, I stopped accepting those freebies, as we call them. Um, but every critic and every newspaper reaches a different situation, uh, different practice with this. Um, so I can't lay down a universal law about ethics. In New York, um, ethical practice was very strict indeed. Um, and that was very interesting and freeing. And I'm sure you know, that, that there, was a, there was a lot to learn uh, really about what was correct. I hope that makes sense. Uh, okay, so Asha is uh, uh, now continuing uh, saying, what do you do when the critic sees himself as a social media star? and loses all propriety about the gravities and responsibility of the role of the critic. <laughs> um, oh, that's hard because I do a lot of social media myself and I have a few thousand followers on Facebook and 7,000 on Instagram and I, I know you are very active in fact, I mean, you know, every, <laughs> whatever you do every day. I, I... <laughs> but I, but I, but I, I, I find social media very interesting. I hope that on the whole, I am not the star, that I do social media because I'm looking at other things. I think I only put photographs of myself in when I'm showing what lectures I'm about to be given or whatever talk I'm giving. Otherwise, I'm just looking at life and sometimes it's not the arts, but I'm also sharing dance history, theatre history, all of those things. Um, I, I investigated social media really because I thought a critic's life involves so many different areas of thought and research and travel that this would be interesting for readers to find out about. Um, it doesn't, it's social media doesn't, isn't really the issue. The danger is if a critic, whether he is in a newspaper or on social media or on television, whether he regards himself, she regards herself as the star or whether the art form, the subject matters more. Um, there are some very great and wonderful critics who are known to be um, stars in a way, but as long as they make their subject entertaining and important rather than their own celebrity, then they're doing their business. I can think of a few critics who have let their celebrity go to their head and uh, I can think of say two theatre critics who I always feel are beating on their chest as if say I'm the big deal here listen to what I'm saying and I was I'm embarrassed to read that who knows people may there may be people who think I'm doing that too but I try not to feel present myself as the star I think I'm a, a prism people should be seeing the art through me not seeing me good. Thank you. So I think I uh, let's do my uh, last question is mine and I ask uh, you think that is uh, essential to have been a dancer for a, for a dance critic? Well I wasn't a dancer so that answers that but almost, how can I put it I th if, if you are a dancer or have you been a dancer um, use your experience whatever experience you have use it. When I became a critic, I've just felt so ignorant. Um, and I start, tried to watch dancers take class. Um, I've spent the next 40, 45 years trying to speak to dancers about what they do. Um, I don't know that having been a dancer solves half the problems, because if I say I had trained in ballet, 
um, I might only look at ballet values when I looked at Indian dancing. I might always want people to point their feet. Um, there are a lot of ballet people, trained ballet people, who like the very pulled up, spread out look of the ballet body, and they can't adjust to the weightier look of either modern dancers or Indian dancers. Um, they don't even quite look like the look, say, of tango, whatever. So I, you do need an open mind, whatever your training, your background is. Um, there's so much more than dancing to write about, though. You've really got to know, or you should develop a sense of history, of lighting, of music. Music, I think, above all, most forms of dance are connections with music. And you've got, got to investigate further and further how this music and this dance connect. And the more, you can never come to the end of analyzing how music and dance connect. There's so many subtleties and each dancer responds to the same music slightly differently. Um, that's a big, big field. Thank you so much. I think uh, uh, we can uh, maybe close here. I see that everybody is thanking uh, you for the wonderful uh, session. Thank you. Thank you for the very good questions. <laughs> yeah, I think we have more or less replied to everything. Yes. Goodbye to everybody. Namaste. Bye.